everybody. Uh, today is, as you know, is June the 29th. It's the reopening of our country and a new day and a new dawn. So I'd like to wish you all the best, very best on our journey. But today I'm really pleased to welcome you to the IIEA webinar. I know you'll be kind of getting your seats at the moment, but this webinar, as you know, is on France and the future of innovation uh, in Europe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the Digital Futures Group here at the IIEA. I'm delighted today to be joined by Professor Gilles Bavinet, who's a digital entrepreneur and advisor at the Institute Montaigne. The Institute is an independent think tank and it's dedicated to public policy in France and in Europe. Jean, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really pleased that you could take time out of your busy schedule to be with us. We know you're particularly busy at this time. Uh, Gilles will speak to us for around um, 20 uh, minutes or so. And after that, then I will come back to you uh, for questions and answers. Today, he will offer, G will offer us his perspective on the future of innovation in France and Europe and discuss how to develop a dynamic innovation and digital ecosystem. Um, I look forward to receiving your questions, the audience, and you may join the discussion by using the Q&A function on Zoom. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session. And once Gilles has completed his presentation, I will come back to you. I'd really appreciate if you give your name and affiliation at the end of your question. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A is on the record, and it will be available on our website later this afternoon. We'd also like you to feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at the IIEA. But now it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome our distinguished uh, guest, uh, Gilles Fabinet. Gilles, as I said, is a digital entrepreneur and advisor at Institute Montaigne. Gilles, you may remember that you, you were with us here in a different time, in a different age, back in 2013, when you were the digital champion for France. So you're welcome back in a completely different situation. He is professor in, pu uh, in public policy and digital affairs at Sciences Po in France and is the French representative to the European Commission for Digital Affairs. He's a particular interest in the areas of education and inclusion linked to digital technology. Gilles is also vice chair of the French National Digital Council and he has written and published extensively on technology and data. Jean, you are most welcome. Indeed, welcome back to the IIEA, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you for IIEA uh, for organizing this, this discussion. I mean, it's, uh, it's really the right time to, to do this because we need to reset this world in a different manner. So I'm very pleased to be able to, to join you, actually, and um, to, I would say, tighten the links that may exist in between the organization and obviously uh, Institute Montaigne uh, in general. So my, my talk today is obviously about the innovation across Europe. And uh, you know, it's interesting because Europe is generally said to be lagging behind regarding the digital revolution. Uh, it's very much tied to the fact that uh, whatever the type of key services we would use, social media, search, online shopping, watching a movie. We generally go through uh, one of these big platforms, Facebook, Amazon, uh, of this world. And, and you know, if we dig further and look at the number of uh, big startups called unicorns, uh, Europe is also by far lagging behind. Even though this company overall still waits, not much, you know, compared to the overall economy, uh, they nonetheless represent the future, new forms of organization based on data, uh, new forms of innovation, new standard of, of enterprise overall. So, which is why it's important to make sure that, you know, we are there and we also have 
some of these big corporations, big companies, uh, basically to take a role in, in general. And it's interesting because the reason why Europe and um, the, especially the continental Europe, uh, putting apart the UK, is so much lagging behind, it's kind of a mystery. You know, business-wise, uh, Europe is doing well. It's comparable to the USA. Uh, it has a very strong economy, good infrastructures, uh, good educational systems, but to some extent, the gap is, is not really easy to, to explain. So if we try to understand why there are such a difference, uh, we could check on several factors uh, that would refrain our potential. And I've tried to classify these factors uh, per order of importance in general. To me, th there are a few, maybe five, not more. The, the first one uh, is clearly the, the human capital. Uh, even though I just mentioned that uh, we both have, compared to the US, excellent uh, education system, I believe that the difference in between the US and, and Europe is the fact that uh, US has been very good at attracting talents, you know, educating people and keeping the good one. You know, so they are exceptionally good at it. They have created what we called HB1 visas. And actually it's interesting because it's been like shut down by President Trump like only four to five days ago. And, and that has led to a concentration of human capital, especially in the Silicon Valley, that is probably unseen anywhere else in, in the world. You know, so that's very key. And I think it's, it's a very consistent federal strategy that's been on since like at least two to three decades in general. Uh, the, the second factor to me is the innovation model. Um, in Europe, we have given a clear priority to corporate innovation. And I would say even more institutional uh, innovation. In the US and in China, uh, innovation is more commonly celebrated and welcomed from the civil society in general. Uh, it's, uh, there is a general belief that if you big, uh, if, you, if you become a corporation, bureaucracy is kind of inevitable. And, and therefore, it would freeze your organization and limit your opportunity to, to do some disruptive innovation. It's interesting because if you look at, for instance, Tesla or SpaceX, both companies are competing with traditional players, the car makers on one hand, the NASA on the other, and you know, if you read the, the, the US um, medias in general, they really foresee, uh, and I would say they, they challenge uh, the potential of uh, this traditional innovation versus these newcomers. In, in China, it's a little bit different. It's more the pure notion of uh, entrepreneurship that is at stake. You know, everybody knows in China the, the history of Huawei, how it's been created with the funding of uh, Five thousand uh, dollars in the first place, and how it become what it is today, and it's a kind of a, the mythology of of China to believe that everyone can do that as well, you know. And in in Europe, I think it's a little bit different. It's um, we we have difficulties to unleash the potential of the youngster generation. Uh, it's still very much institutional. And um, we still very much believe that breakthrough innovation can come from institutional um, systems. And, um, and therefore, um, there are a lot of, I would say, money that's been uh, invested in several chapters, several initiatives directly from uh, the, uh, I would say, institution in general. And on top of that, we tend to create some regulation that could be quite, I would say, slowing the traditional business. Uh, GDPR, it's obviously a very good regulation, but uh, it's also kind of a huge problem for SMEs and um, I would say mid-sized companies in, in general. So it's, I would say, a lot of 
a matter of culture uh, in general that, that we see at stake. And uh, I think that the fact that um, the US has for a very long time uh, been willing to unleash the potential of uh, disruptive innovators, especially in the Silicon Valley, has helped to create a very consistent ecosystem uh, in general. Uh, the, the, the first factor, uh, I believe, is um, European integration. It's not exaggerated to say that all startups are struggling to expand their business beyond the birth country. You know, the, the, the two de facto leaders, uh, USA and China, have respectively a digital runway of uh, 330 and uh, 1.5 billion uh, potential users. Uh, you know, it's, it helps a lot because you can test your algorithms, especially if you are in an AI um, business on a much larger uh, number of people. And, 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 and the reach helps a lot, you know, if you have only a teeny fraction of these people who could use a service, on some hand, uh, you won't be able to break even because this fraction will be too small. And if you are in the US or in China, that would let you break through and, and develop your business. So that's, that's a problem. And it's interesting to notice that um, most of the companies that have been able to become unicorn or decacorns are uh, in Europe, very much uh, the one we're facing, uh, I would say, uh, cross-border regulation, you know, banking and music, uh, like uh, uh, Spotify, N26, uh, Revolut, company like that, who benefited from, uh, I would say, um, I would say a, a level playing field that were um, all across Europe in general. The, the, the fifth factor, uh, I think, is uh, something which is a little bit difficult to size. It's what I would call the cluster effect. The fact that we can, you can create links, links in between corporations, uh, academics, universities, startups uh, in general, and, and make sure that you make a very good uh, mixture of all these uh, different parameters. I think that, you know, Stanford, uh, the Technion in Israel, uh, a few of, of these places in general have been instrumental in the success of this, uh, this, this countries, this place in the digital era in general. In Europe, it's more difficult. Maybe we can mention uh, Cambridge in the UK, uh, a few of the places uh, across Europe, but it's not as big as what we can see uh, in uh, the, the US or in China in general. And it should be uh, a consistent strategy uh, from the European Union uh, or from the, 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 the government, from uh, the European government in general. I very much believe that one uh, dead angle that we haven't explored yet is uh, the notion of cluster uh, in general. Uh, the thing I haven't touched upon yet is uh, private equity. And, you know, I've been uh, a, a very strong voice for having more private equity in Europe over the past decade. And I think that uh, that's necessary, obviously, and, and we have done much better to that extent. But it's more of a consequence than, uh, I would say, a, a point that you put, you should put in first place you know it's it's something which comes when you have good startups when you have good entrepreneurs in general um, the private equity from all over the world can can reach you uh, at some place and you can see some countries such as Sweden for instance where there are very few um, private equity players and still their startups get financed very well because just the startups are noticed and uh, seen from the other side of the Atlantic and, and people move there to finance this uh, startup. You know? So I think it's, uh, and plus I believe that uh, in terms of, of, um, of, um, of taxation, uh, in some countries, especially in France, it used to be a nightmare. And you know, given that the government have understood that uh, we need to uh, use this uh, 
this new way of financing companies, taxation system is much better than, than it, what it used. So it's, it's the main factors. I believe that there might be a few uh, others at stake in here uh, in general. Uh, for instance, I believe that uh, mastering in English is really key as well. If you look at the most advanced country across Europe, uh, it's places like uh, Holland or the, the Netherlands where people are very familiar with this uh, language. Uh, probably uh, Ireland is a good example as well. Uh, you have plenty of uh, uh, technology and digital players uh, in general. So that, that may play. Uh, maybe that may very strongly play as well. Uh, but it's, you have a few of these factors. Um, I'd like maybe to, to, to stress on what is going on in France uh, in general, that may be of interest of the audience. I believe that, uh, you know, uh, until recently, there were no interest into trying to develop the French technology ecosystem until 2013. It was completely unseen uh, by the government. They, they didn't pay attention to it. And uh, in, in 2013, uh, we had the first move with the creation of BPI, which is Bank Public Investment, uh, which uh, is a, obviously has its uh, name says uh, a public bank system with the mandate to uh, clearly invest into technology, mostly uh, in a venture capital type. And that was a type of electroshock. Uh, in the, the years that came afterward, uh, we had the creation of the largest incubator in the world, uh, the Station F, uh, which now hosts like uh, 3,000 uh, startups uh, in general. We also had the funding of uh, the Ecole 42, uh, which is a very high-end um, school for um, like full-stack colors uh, in general, and a bunch of other very good initiatives such as the launch of the French tech ecosystem, the Grand Ecole du Numérique. More recently, we had a very strong AI initiative, but you know, it's, it's, if you look at it, um, it was very late. I mean, we launched this initiative like only seven years ago. If you compare it to, let's say, Israel or the UK, what strikes in first place is that most of what they did was initiated in the 90s. You know, in, in the UK, maybe by the, the, the turning of the, the new uh, century. Uh, but it's old and, you know, to, to create ecosystem, it takes time basically. So I believe that we have the right policy um, and we have plenty of new startups coming. We're still lagging behind in terms of unicorns. Uh, but I believe that there are a few countries that, are, that have more, I would say, will to develop this uh, digital ecosystem, uh, not only in terms of investment of billion poured into uh, this thing, but also in the fact that uh, uh, we are transforming the e-government policies in general. We're trying to push schools to uh, integrate some uh, coding uh, chapters or courses uh, in general. So it's very coordinated in between the different uh, aspects of the general policies of, of the countries. And you know it might work. It, it's likely that you know in the long run, it would work. It would work. The only the only concern I have that it was very late. It's been launched only a few years ago. Uh, we took time to realize that this would be the future uh, in general. So I think that you know if there is a, a blocking factors, uh, some blocking factors in general. Uh, the, the key one to me uh, might mostly be the cultural one. The fact that um, the, the European continent in terms of uh, average age of its um, citizens is like six years older than uh, the US and this counts uh, because you're more likely to innovate if you're young and, and that helps you know, to have a, a younger generation uh, population uh, in general. 
And also I believe that uh, in the US and probably in China as well, there is a very profound trust that technology uh, can help to save the world, to make the world better and, and so on. It might be exaggerated. Sometimes it's mentioned as a little bit naive, but still it, it's very key. The cultural aspects of this is really important. Uh, in terms of early education, I believe that systems such as uh, flipped classroom is key as well, you know, to make some bonding in between, you know, members, to let them share ideas. Um, theater lessons, for instance, uh, is a very good exercise as well. To know how to pitch is key as well. You know, things that you're more likely to learn uh, if you're attending a um, US schooling system than a European one. It's so true that now the PISA um, ranking from the OECD is taking into account this aspect, you know, the, the bonding, the, the, the flipped classroom stuff into their evaluation system uh, in general. So these are things that we should more uh, develop across Europe and probably especially in France where we still very fascinated by the, the notion of vertical power in, in general, which to me is completely against uh, the, the world to come uh, in general. But still, it's going in the right direction. Um, if, if I was to talk about the reason why we should uh, stay optimistic, the first reason is the quality of the human capital across Europe. You know, if, if you were to make a very rough comparison in between LMD, uh, Lisa's master doctorate, uh, with the US and China, we are far, far, far ahead of these two places. We have the human capital. And you know, it's something which is uh, very resilient. It's, it, it takes a lot of time to build and a lot of time to dismantle uh, in general. So I believe that uh, this is here to stay and uh, we should definitely leverage that to uh, create um, the Europe of the future. So, so that's one thing. Um, second thing which I've noticed, which is probably tied to this, is the, the capital efficiency. Um, there was um, an English, um, a British investor called Victor Basta, who made some research and he has proven that um, the ratio of invested capital into startup is far more, more efficient in Europe than in the US. In, in other words, you need to put much more money to create a unicorn in the US than in Europe. So that might be due to the fact that we have much less of it, of it, of it so therefore, you have more uh, quality from the few that you have, a concentration of, of quality. But also the fact that, you know, we may have better people in general. So that's something we should realize. And maybe we can just scale it up, you know, putting more uh, money at work into a very tiny startup, early stage uh, uh, business angel type thing. And, you know, mechanically, we would end up by having better, uh, more larger startup in, in general. Um, other things that may have their, their the value, you know, in there is that to have more uh, coordinated policies um, in Europe, um, for instance, regarding the military, you know, uh, given that we have new type of threats, we now want to build a European uh, a military body in general. This was, this was in, in the US and in China and in Israel as well, completely instrumental in the making of their uh, digital ecosystem in general. And I believe that we might see a replication of that uh, for uh, tackle the climate change in general. You know, Europe is very good at it. Uh, we are much more, uh, I would say, um, virtuous in general regarding uh, our climate policy. And I think that on the long run, you know, trying to merge environment and uh, digital technology uh, will probably create a new discipline. And we could lead there. We have lost the battle regarding, I would say, uh, B2C services in general, retail services, consumer services, 
uh, we could win the one regarding uh, technology and uh, climate change in, in general. That is now being discussed uh, at the Commission and um, some commissionary are very strongly aligned uh, in the view that we should uh, put a lot of investment in there and we should try to, to build some clusters and ecosystem across Europe that would be specialized into this era. And personally, I, I believe it would be really right. It would make a lot of sense and you know it's very long phases in general uh, if you look at the um, the the what i just mentioned the the retail services to, to consumers that are you know the the services brought by the the fong the the big platforms in general they are all in in this business um it it took like three years to create and it might take another like 20 years to create those newcomers but i think I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. So that was what I wanted to tell you. I, I'm very open to any questions that could come from the audience regarding this, uh, uh, all these uh, key ecosystem European uh, issues. Thank you very much, Gilles, for that very interesting presentation. It was a great overview and an analysis of quite a complex issue, but I thought it was good that you were optimistic about the future and saw that the challenges could be met. i just like, if I could, maybe start, because you raised it there towards the end, ask you one question, um, because it's just happened overnight. Uh, do you think with the new elections of the Greens and the Green Wave in France, is going to accelerate that merger between, if you like, what the Europeans are called the Green Deal and the G digital agenda. Would that make a difference or was it already happening? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And actually, we just spoke about it um, this morning with Institute Montaigne. We had a discussion on that. I, you know, I think that the French Greens are still in the making. You know, it's different from uh, the German ones, um, they, I've, they have views to me which are sometimes a little bit romantic and it's not science-based enough. So uh, okay. what we think is that um, we should definitely try to help these forces uh, to be more rational and as a think tank to push some content uh, to, to compare what they propose and what could be alternatives yeah. in general based some time on technology okay thank you it's the beginning but it is it does give optimism for the future around those areas um i could i ask you actually audience to look at your q a function on zoom and um, when you're asking the question and again if you could give your name and um your designation of where you're working would be very helpful um, I see there's a, a question in here, uh, Gilles, on for Francis called for internet and technology regulation beyond digital tax on big tech as part of its soft, soft power internationally. What might this look like in the data economy and how might the US position be factored into this? And this is from Claude Quain, the researcher here at the IIEA. Okay, thank you, Claude. It's quite interesting. I mean, you know, we, we all see that there are some problems uh, in general with um, the fung, uh, whether it's um, economical or, you know, like antitrust issues or, you know, content-wise with Facebook and uh, hate speech and so on. So, and um, we see that they, they may bear risk on um, Elections, for instance, uh, you know, it's especially uh, presidential elections. Uh, it's been trolled uh, by players, which sometimes are like countries, uh, not to mention Russia, for instance. So it, it's concerned that um, it's legitimate to have. But, you know, I, I think the big thing is uh, to make sure that we don't arm the, I would say, um, innovation in general. So. 
I mentioned in my talk, uh, GDPR. GDPR, in some, to some extent, it's a very good idea. Um, it's, it's clear now that it's, it's a hassle. It's, it's a big problem for, for small player, players in general. So I, I think that, you know, France is very much pushing, pushing for this. Uh, but it's interesting to have, I would say, um, controversial debate in general on how to make it without arming the, the potential of innovation that may come from entrepreneurs uh, in general. So uh, I believe whether uh, it's um, towards uh, big platforms or uh, regarding all the type of digital payers, uh, we have to have some regulation, uh, whether regarding taxation issues or whatever else. Uh, but we need to be careful. We need to be careful not to arm the business in general. And, you know, I, I'm, I have like daily, on a daily basis, some interaction with uh, members of the government in, in, in France. And um, it's not easy for them to, to get that. But I think they are progressively understanding that it's, it's, it's critical. You know, it's essential to make sure that we don't only regulate for uh, lowering the, the potentiality of this platform. Yeah, and do you think it's quite interesting at the moment that maybe uh, business is actually being proactive in this way and taking away, you know, advertisements like uh, Unilever or, Ver or Verizon, you know, that they're actually making a statement themselves. Do so you think that will actually bring about a climate where this becomes a much more uh, focused discussion. Oh yeah, it's it's fascinating to see that, you know. I, I think everybody's aware that uh, Unilever, Unilever has boycotted, boycotted uh, Facebook for, uh, and, and doesn't want to, to give them money um, regarding the, the policies in general in, in, into the way they moderate the debate, which favors the extremists uh, in general. And I, I, I believe that you know, it's interesting because first it's global, it's seen from everywhere in the world. And, and secondly, it pushes corporations to become activists, uh, yeah. which usually they are very reluctant to be. You know? So that's, that's, to me, it's, it's, it's a, a sea change in general. Mm. So it's quite interesting. We are entering into new territories. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, this new suggestion of a um, digital or a, a dividend or a data dividend that's being suggested where, in fact, consumers, the citizens are paid for their data uh, is another way. It's a new, it's, it's the beginning of a discussion. I don't think it's been very well thought out, but it does go to your point that, um, there is a, a, a climate now for that discussion and perhaps alternative options other than taxation. Um, yeah. Sorry. It's an old idea, um, the, the, the digital dividend. I think the first who brought it up was Jaron Lanier, probably 12 years ago. I, okay. He wrote a fascinating book about that. Hmm. So it's not, there's nothing new in, the, in this suggestion. No, what is new is that it went through, I would say, technocrats, which is a good news. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. been it's been it's been processed by people who know how to make taxation, and that's probably quite new. Now, there's a, a question in here from Seamus Allen, and it's it's to your point about the education system and perhaps the the mindset and so on is asking, the EU is working on a new digital education action plan and updating the skills agenda. What should be done in these initiatives to close the gap in human capital with the US and China? Uh, you know, I worked on the previous one, the Agenda 2020, which had a very strong chapter on education in general. And I, you know, the, the first thing we need to do, uh, which is still necessary, is uh, to educate the politician about the, the need to, to create this type of jobs. You know, especially uh, in France, which I know well, I can tell you that it's not clear enough for these people 
that you, you train someone to become a full stack coder and this person will immediately have a very good job. You know, so that's, that's not something they have understood yet, you know. So as a result, we are struggling to, to, to find this type of profiles. And it's the same story all across Europe, you know. So it's, it's obvious that uh, we should um, create some funding for universities um, to, to create this, um, this curriculums and to make sure that they have, um, I would say, a level of uh, expertise which is um, standardized. That's really yeah. key to, 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 to make sure that uh, potential employers are fine, uh, I would say, have trust in the, those profiles. The system. And would that be a core part of every curriculum? Or just, you know, to me, yes, it yeah. has to because you know whether if you do let's say anthropology, yeah. um, if you know how to use let's say Air for instance, which is a data crunching software, mm -hmm. it will help you to do your stats and and you're gonna be more efficient. Yes, um, indeed, yeah. I, I don't know any type of expertise which wouldn't be lifted up uh, with uh, digital. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's an important point. There's another question here from Mary Cleary, who's the, um, from the Irish Computer Society, and she's asking the question, in the context of human capital that you mentioned, and the shortage of high-level IT experts, to what extent is the lack of regulation of the IT profession an issue in the development of the European digital ecosystem? Uh, I'm not sure I'm, 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 I get this question right. Um, what type of regulation would you, would you see necessary? I think, you know, we need to have something which is, I just, as I just mentioned, um, standardized um, profiles, mm -hmm. like, you know, competencies uh, in general. It will help people to... Uh, to travel cross border across Europe, like LMD did, you know, LMD is mm -hmm. a very good example of what we should do in general. This is not really from the European Union, actually, it's from, from the Bologna uh, processus uh, mm -hmm. in general. Uh, and I, I think what we should also have probably is, I would say, some vertical definition of skill sets. Yeah. You know, because, um, like, uh, let's say, uh, a cybersecurity expert, uh, it's not the same thing, let's say, in Ireland than in France, you know, mm -hmm. and this is an issue as well. You know? mm -hmm. So you need, as, as an employer, I used to be an employer in the digital mm -hmm. space, uh, you need to assess the people in front of you all the time, and you spend a lot of energy to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And you discover later on on the road that the person you've just hired, she's it's very good at something, but not at something not else. Everything, yeah. What do you think is the best way to go about that? Is that within a framework in Europe? Um, because each member state has a different system in a sense. You create a, an overall framework as part of our development of that digital agenda. Yeah, I, I, you know, to, to that extent, I don't see any, any, any problem in having more integration, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's about um, uh, the, 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 the free uh, circulation of data across Europe, uh, the circulation of human capital, of whatever else. Uh, I mean, digital is, it's, 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 um, it's very ubiquitous in general. So it would really help, you know, that would be a unique opportunity um, to create some policies okay. that are really focusing especially on the, the development of digital to make some integration. You know, if we had, for instance, APIs in between mm -hmm. e-government uh, in, in Europe, it will tremendously help the integration uh, in general. Mm -hmm. So that's something we should definitely should do. Been, but yeah. That, that goes to another point, which is the, the skill sets of the politicians in general, which are very low. Mm. You have that digital 
pass that in France, you've created that for as part of, of the development of that skills agenda. Did you find it, did you think that was good or have I got um, the right one? Yeah, it's, it's an early initiative. Um, it's what we did in France is uh, what we call Grand École du Numérique, uh, which mm. is probably, um, it's, it's, the pass is not that well known, you know, it's okay. been created like four years ago, but uh, it's not mandatory in all the curriculum, all the, the what you could do at university in general. Uh, what is probably more um, efficient in general is Grand École de Numérique. It's, it's not a, a Grand École, so to say, it's not a high school. It's, um, it's basically a fund, a governmental fund that would help universities and any type of organization that would want to create a, a, a computer science course. Okay. Um uh, the question from Ethna McDermott, who's a member of the IIEA, and she asked the question, how can you ensure that women have a core role in the world of digital affairs? How do you ensure their interests and needs are recognized, whatever the policy design? Yeah, that's, that's really um, something we need to be extremely uh, consistent and um, we, we have to push for that, you know. The, the obviously one of the key problem of this industry it's uh, it's a male industry and it it creates problems everywhere uh, in the culture in um, the design uh, so we need to, to rebalance that strongly and it starts with uh, early school mm. it's it's very similar to math i mean at least yeah. in france uh, it's mostly uh, men who do math and um, although women are generally better at school in math we end up by having you know in, in terms of uh, university graduation it's almost uh, like two-thirds if not more uh, of of men versus women who are graduated so it's um you know it has to go through policies that come from the top of the government uh because otherwise it's too technical. It has to be uh, at the political right. agenda of the people you work for, because it, it touches upon so many different aspects. You know, the, 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 let's say, for instance, as the, 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 the minister of, of culture in France, they do finance film, movie, you know, they do that a lot, mm. put a lot of money in there. We should pay attention on the role of the people in those movies, you know, because it's the way um, you very softly uh, bring ideas uh, to people and therefore make sure that uh, if you have, <clears throat> let's say, a hero who is the cutter, it's not yes. always a man, you know, for instance, yeah, it's yeah. one of the things. So it's, it's, I would say, very ubiquitous uh, policies that could deal with this, starting with the mm. only school at, up to the end of the education process okay. in general and touching on many other aspects in general. I do believe in uh, strong gender policies, uh, making sure that as, uh, let's say, an organization, you have to put some commitment uh, to make sure that you have X percent of women at certain sense, then you progressively increase that as well. So, yeah, no, that it has to be really, again, focused intervention. And I agree with you at, a, at an early stage, at primary level. But I, I, what do you think about the role of parents or guardians in this? Because yeah, their it, expectations are also it, kind of stereotyped, I think, aren't they, in many ways? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the, the pink dress. Yes. You know, it's... Symptom in general. Blue for girls, blue for boys, and pink for girls. Yeah, so. yeah, and you know, I spoke to one of my best friends. He's very much willing to make sure that uh, he doesn't create stereotype to his kids. And he said, you know, even though it's it's something I'm very conscious, you you fall into it a lot of times in, in general. Yeah. So I, I think that sure, parents have a role in there but i i strongly believe that 
the educational system is probably something we should mm -hmm. should probably master and and change much more easily than changing the mindset of parents in general. Mm -hmm. I've a question here from Chloe Sullivan, public affairs consultant. Do you think individual countries or national governments have a responsibility to drive and embrace digital disruption? For example, as you know, Ireland has just appointed a new government. Should we be encouraging new ministers to embrace digital disruption? We do. We should. We should. Mm. Um, it's. Uh, one of the key things I'm struggling in France is uh, the, the very limited competence of the politician in here, you know. Mm. You need to explain all the time what is good and what isn't good and how technology works in general. And, you know, something which strikes me is um, in Israel or in China, like 50% of the politicians have an engineering or a scientific background. I, I think that there is a correlation with the success of these countries in, uh, in the, the digital space uh, in general. So, and, and to tell you the truth, one of the things I did over the past uh, 18 last months is I created a MOOC on um, um, uh, public administration and digital. You know, I, I did that because I was so frustrated with um, the, the very weak competencies that I wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, to bring my share. Yeah. To... And what was the take up of that, you? It hasn't been launched. It's supposed to be launched uh, on this Friday. Oh, good. We'll follow that. It's in French, is it? I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good yeah. idea. We Sorry might look that. at that. I'd um, love to have it. Absolutely. Oh. Chloe, yeah. Chloe may, may follow up on that. So that would be very interesting. Um, I have a question now from Madeleine Clark, Executive Director of the Genio Partnering with Philanthropy in Europe, supported by DGRTD, Horizon to Find and Support Evidence Based Social Innovation to Develop Plans. So that's, it. that's quite an undertaking. And she wants, she asked the question, can you comment on how he sees the potential for digital innovations that can contribute to overcoming the social challenges we face across Europe to be encouraged? Oh, thank you. That's a very good question. I, you know, it's, it's what we call, there is what we call digital divide. The fact that, uh, Mm. Instead of reducing the gap in between, let's say, poor and rich, it increases this gap in general. And the COVID crisis has um, shown that actually, you know, the, um, if you had, um, I would say, parents who were pushing you to do your work, uh, your school work and so on, uh, you were most likely to, to, to be coming from high-end mm, societies and any other. So it's um, something we are looking at the French level and uh, the digital champion program uh, that I belong to uh, has this uh, goal as well. And, you know, I, I think that some countries have shown the way, actually. Uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, uh, Sweden, for instance, you know, they are very serious about how to use this uh, technology uh, for impaired people, for um, disabled people in general, for um, the, the elderly, um, for all these people. And they are creating some um, tools and platforms that are especially made for these people in general. So it's um, the reason why I believe uh, it can work is that Basically, the technology allows you to leverage um, a system, you know, so mm -hmm. if you do platform, it's a big investment, but it worked for, uh, it worked for a non-tier category of people uh, mm -hmm. in general. So it's, um, it's mostly, uh, I would say, a matter of political will as well, you know, like gender. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I, 
the thing we need to to do at the european level is to identify the best practices and uh yeah. i would say to to let other countries um to see that and because yeah. are, for instance I know initiatives in Romania that are really stunning, that, that are the best I, I could imagine of, uh, for helping um, people to, to learn how to read and to count and so on. Mm. It's been launched by a, another digital champion. He, he has created like a 6,000 spots where you can do that using platforms. Uh, so okay. it's, it's, it's big, it's, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's really important. And just taking up that is, am I getting it right, Jean? The idea of creating um, a kind of library or database of best practice and use cases. Do you think that could be done in each country or in a European level, you know, so that people can have access to them? I think that's been to be done by each country uh, because uh, yeah, you have yeah. language barrier, uh, you have cultural. Mm -hmm barriers as well uh, mm. and uh, but uh, what should be done at the EU level is uh, sharing the information sharing the information yeah. uh, well, it's very interesting uh, you know in this in this pandemic time you know it's been a great help our emphasis on mental health but in fact digital technology has transformed the whole delivery of mental health services and I think the politicians have seen that so that's another example I don't know if that, that certainly has happened here in Ireland. I don't know if it, has that happened in France. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, it's I'm not sure, but very, I would welcome that. It's, it's yeah. You, you mentioned, um, you know, how good in your presentation, how good the UK was, you know, in terms of making progress and, as you said, back with Cambridge in the 90s and so on. Do you think post Brexit will the UK be a significant digital competitor in the EU, EU along with China and the US? You know how will how will it fare? You know it's very difficult to say, uh, and depending to who you listen to, uh, mm. get some <coughs> very different views. I I don't know. I don't know. I'd say that you know on the traditional economy. What is about to come for the UK is not good uh, in general, but I, I would be less certain about that regarding the digital economy in general. Mm. It's um, they would need to have some agreements uh, with uh, the EU regarding regulation and to be part of the level playing field, which apparently they don't want to be. They don't want to, yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, uh, to some extent, they have reached such a level which they can develop some platforms uh, on the same ground as the US is doing, you know. So they, they manage to expand the platform dealing with the regulation of national countries uh, well, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, uh, it's, it's possible, but it's unsure. I, I think, you know, forces um the the uk is um a great country but it's very fragile and i to me the biggest risk that they are facing is human capital it's to have i would say a, a very strong leak of people who used to to be willing to work there and who will quit the country because they feel that it's not the place they have to be now uh, post Brexit, and and that may be the biggest risk for for, for them. But it's unsure. It's it's difficult to say. We saw that people would leave the country uh, past the first uh, step of the Brexit pro process, and actually they haven't as much as we expected. No, and I think today they're having a, another meeting and things are, are not looking that good. So I, I think your observations are, are, are very well made. Um, I've got one question about maybe to, to finish. Um, you know, a central theme on Van der Leyen's commission and of course, President um, Macron is an emphasis on Europe's digital sovereignty. Now, you know, what are your thoughts on this? 
is it necessary for Europe to be digitally competitive, to have digital sovereignty? Mm. It, it goes, I think it goes beyond the notion of uh, economy. It's also um, go against, um, I would say, disinformation uh, in general, and um, it's, it touches um, cybersecurity and so on. You know, it's, I, I read a book from Alan Greenberg. Um, I can't remember the, 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 the titles of the book, but it touches uh, about cybersecurity in general. And it's incredible to see how, how weak are, weak are, are these um, systems in general. Uh, it, it, it might be, it, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to discover that uh, uh, it's possible to stop the whole Europe as a continent, you know, all the systems, all the supply chains, all the trains, all the, the things. It's what it yeah. implies in general. So it's um, one of the reasons why we're very uh, concerned with Huawei. And I, yeah, uh, to me, if we want to be part of the future, to make a long story short, I think we need to regain our sovereignty in general, which means that uh, we need to probably be quite tough at uh, Huawei, but not only these people. Um, a lot of platforms coming from the US, uh, all the, the Cloud Act in general, uh, we need to have a say on that and, uh, and to be tough, you know. Mm. We need to to have a political vision at the so that's I couldn't be clear. Hmm. Yeah, well, gee, that's a, a very positive note to end this uh, webinar on, and uh, because it is about having a vision, it is about creating that climate for change and support uh, within your citizens and and institutions within Europe, and I think that's a very uh, positive message. And I'd like to thank you very much for your very thoughtful presentation and also for your answers and your considerations. And there's a number of ideas I think you've raised there. And thanks to our participants and for, for asking those questions. I really appreciate it very much. Um, I hope we we'll welcome you back again to the IAEA but perhaps physically again yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, at, at another time and hope things will be good in, 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 to you and, and to your work. Um, I'd like to thank you again for your participation. Really appreciate it, Jean, and also to thank our, our audience. And if I could take this opportunity, you've mentioned cybersecurity there, but uh, one of the next dates for your diary for our audience here is on uh, July the 13th. Johan Lapazar, who is Executive Director of the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, will be making a presentation at one o'clock. And on Tuesday, the 14th of July, Helen Dixon, our Data Protection Commissioner, will be uh, looking at the GDPR. You, you mentioned that two years on. You know what two-year-olds are like, so it'll be interesting what she has to say. And it's her reflections on how, how things have happened. So thank you again for your questions and for your participations and Jean for your uh, excellent presentation. And we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Pleasure. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.